I came up today to support the fishermen of Gloucester. I mean, we're all, you know, we're all gonna take a hit here. You're watching the true essence of this country, like the farmers in the Midwest, being pushed aside, being railroaded into going out of business. We've lost 5,000 jobs in Massachusetts and 830 vessels. We saw the dream of our children wiped out, and now we get cut down again. This harbor out here has seen fishing for 400 years, and we're not going to let it stop now. Chatham is a shoreside community on the peninsula of Cape Cod. It has 16 miles of coastline in this small little area between the coves and inlets. It's a really small town in the winter, probably 6,000 people reside here. It's quintessential Cape Cod. My husband Ernie and I have deep roots on the Cape. We go back to the first settlers. And we still fish the same way our great grandfathers did. Did you want this net here? Oh, sure, okay. It's a little known fishing technique called a weir. The weir traps fish in the heart of a maze of nets and poles. What they can't use is released alive and in good condition. So it's one of the most ancient and sustainable fishing techniques still in use. Ernie's good at what he does because he's done it since he was a little boy. He literally walked into his dad's fishing boots. Innately, I think he has some sense about trap fishing and it's just part of him. His personality is even seasonal. There's a tie and there's a connection between Ernie and I. It goes to the history of my family. My great-grandfather, my grandfather, my brother, my husband, they're all weir fishermen. So there's a deep sense of family history. The industry back in the 1930s was pretty big here. Hundreds of weir traps. A lot of shoreline was owned by the weir companies. Right now, there's four weir companies remaining on the Cape, owned by three families. Weir fishing relies heavily on being able to bring in large quantities of fish in a very short period of time. We have a very short window. As small as 10 days would be our entire season. So it's very important for us to be able to bring in as many fish as we can in that period of time because we don't get another chance. That's why federal regulations make it very difficult for us when they restrict the amount of fish that we can bring in on a given day. Last year, our company caught 600,000 pounds of scup and had to release them. So we could have capitalized on that amount of fish we had, and we weren't allowed to. So what happens is, is this great ancient weir fishing industry is being put out of business by fisheries management. I 
I still have hope. And when next March comes around and we start again, we'll be starting with the same hope and understanding. That's nice. But through the year, we'll be working towards more advocacy and fighting towards getting more of a voice. Cool. Chico, can you just turn and look at me? Just at me. <laughs> Would you be comfortable if we put a little oil on your shoulders just to glisten you up? <laughs> Do you have a girlfriend? I hope she's not going to see it. <laughs> <clears throat> a group of women involved in the fishing industry got together to help promote and support Cape Cod's fishing industries and communities. Hold that thought. How long have you been doing this? I've been doing photography pretty much all my life. How about if we slip the Grundon straps down? One or two. <laughs> oh, oh no, that would be great. <laughs> He's getting into it now. Good. He knows it. Lean on your elbow. There you go. You want me to turn towards you? No, I want full body. Yeah, with full that body. in front of you. I this would way. like yep. to introduce the Cape Cod Fisherman 2002 calendar. <laughs> Mr. January. <laughs> Mr. February. <laughs> Mr. April. <laughs> and we saw Okay, Tim. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. A little more forward. Okay. Every year, starting on June 1st in my house, we put up the altar and then we come together with friends and other people to pray to St. Anthony for many of our needs. Okay, Rabbi. Within our family, within our community, the fishing needs are part of our, of our prayers. My husband and my family, they've always been fishermen. So staying in fishing, it's very, very important to us. Hey, come. <laughs> OK, let's go back to work. Hey, watch it, mister. Tomorrow night, by this time, everything will be in place. The flowers, the candles, everything will be perfect shape. And we will start for the 25th time. The novena again. We have 25 years this year. What do you think? You don't listen. That's why I've been telling you I'm doing yeah, silver. Yeah. 25 years. Ave Maria, piena di grazia. Since I started the novena, my life has gone in different directions. I became involved with the Gloucester Fisherman's Wife in August of 77. We believe that the ocean is sacred. And we believe that as Christian, that's our responsibility, that we need to protect what God has created. The advocacy role that I played was not something planned. I did it in a sense of responsibility. I felt that it was my duty to be involved because things were going to happen and a lot of people were going to get hurt. The fishing community of Gloucester realized that this oil and gas drilling um, might pose a threat to their fishery, and CLF had, had decided to take this on. We formed a very close relationship with these fishermen over the course of this intense litigation. It was the Gloucester Fishermen's Wives and this very small emergent environmental organization taking on essentially the whole oil industry. 
Angela was one of the organizers of it. It was really her baby. Before the oil drilling, the fishing regulation, we were just fishermen's wife. Our husband fished, we stayed home, we take care of children, but we also always had a sense of community because our husband were never around. We had to really roll up our sleeve and go to work. We learned how to be politicians, we learned how to be advocates, we learned to talk to the media. And when we won and actually blocked this oil and gas drilling, you know, I just think a, uh, a friendship was struck there in sort of that time of crisis. However, as the years went by, 25 years later, we see that the environmental people interest is totally, totally different. When we connected back again in the late 1980s to try to start working on the fishery problem, they felt this isn't your domain. You know, you're very helpful with the oil and gas, but we'll take care of the fishing situation. So when we realized that the fishery was in a rapid decline, CLF had to make a very uh, tough political decision. New England fishermen are blasting a recent federal court ruling that says regulators are not doing enough to preserve fishing stocks. The bottom line of this lawsuit is that without fish, you can't have any fishermen. New England needs additional restrictions on fishing. State officials from Maine to Massachusetts are worried that the region's fragile fishing industry could collapse. After we received the news of the lawsuit, Mayor John Bell of Gloucester called the meeting to let the rest of the fishing industry know what this lawsuit was all about and how it would impact our lives. As many of you know, on the 28th of December, Federal Court District Judge Kessler issued a, uh, a judgment which essentially gave the environmental movement more say than the fisheries movement. We are right now in this country in a very bad situation because of years and years of mismanagement. The fish populations are getting so low that we're getting near the point that even if we don't want to shut down the fishery, that may be the only tool we have left. It's very frustrating that groups that normally should be friends have um, decided to really do us in and do us in big. We stay focused on the issues before us. By Our evidence. motivation was not to do them harm. It was simply that a certain amount of economic impact was inevitably going to fall on this fleet that had just grown too big over the years. This potentially affects virtually every commercial fisherman from the mid-Atlantic to Maine. And it is imperative that all of industry see this as the wake-up call that it is. The credit cards are maxed. The loans from the banks need to be paid. Crews need to be paid. Dockage needs to be paid. Fuel needs to be paid. And if you're not going fishing, these things don't get paid. The problem could be so catastrophic to a small community of only 30,000 people that I don't want to really think about it too much right now. I just want to make sure that we get a fair and uh, equitable treatment uh, in Judge Kessler's courtroom. Most trials you get into in the beginning, this is the tail end. The time frame is short. And we want to say in this court case. You know, in my 25 years of involvement with industry, I really believe this is the most critical time where we just have to put every difference aside and work together. So again, 
Thank you for coming and let's hope that we can really move forward. I can offer a motion if you'd like, Dave. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'll offer a motion that the access in the special access programs to closed area two will not be allowed during March and April in order to protect spawning haddock. Love and in favor opposed? It may take a little minute just to make sure the record is clear. I know that's When I decided to, to start covering fine. fishing, it seemed it would be a pretty simple prospect. I'd go to fishing meetings, I'd understand what was happening, and I'd really try to get into the nitty gritty of what was wrong and how to fix it. Page 93, Mr. Chairman, under this 3.4, Point five, point three, point three, point seven. But, you know, I sat in my first yes. fishery council meeting, uh, utterly confused, bewildered, and turned to the person next to me who had been attending fishing meetings and asked him what was going on. And he said, you know, I've been coming here for 20 years and I have no idea. <laughs> the problem is that the council process is complete chaos. Wait a second. Yeah. I've got hands going up and down. So let me, let me do this one more time. So it doesn't matter if you're the little fisherman or a bigwig environmentalist trying to get an answer. And what you get is pure confusion and chaos. And it's purposeful confusion. They simply don't want a clear answer. Because if there's a clear answer, that means change will have to come. The hands are going up intermittently. I, I took the count. I just had a little left. short conversation with Pat Kirkle, and I'm more confused than ever about the. The lawsuit things. didn't come out of thin air. It was born out of frustration of a council system that was just so able to drag its feet every step of the way, all in the name of doing good, and never getting anything done. And it got so bad that environmentalists simply threw their hands up in disgust, literally, and said. We're just going. We're going to go to court. We don't trust the system anymore. It's completely broken. We Didn't we are... already deal with this issue, Mr. Chairman? <clears throat> Excuse me? Wasn't this issue dealt with in an earlier motion? I don't think there's any question about where this crisis came from. Pure and simple government institutional failure. And unfortunately, we have passed the point where we can fix the mismanagement without dislocating some people temporarily and maybe permanently. But the problem is, who are the fishermen left going to be? And that's the question that's hanging in the air. Who is going to be the lucky ones who are going to own the ocean? And by far, when all is said and done, it is the most difficult question to answer. I've been fishing all my life. I started fishing when I was six years old. Go fish it with my father. I go sell the fish in the old time. So, a fisherman, he born fisherman, he like, I try a couple of times, change the job, no way. I love be a fisherman. I born fisherman, I gotta die fisherman, no matter what he said. Growing up in Sicily, everybody fished. That was the only thing that we knew how to do in that community. My grandfather wanted to see us being educated, but I could only go up to the fifth grade because that's the only school was available. So he really forced my father to leave and come to America so we can go get educated. When we came in into Gloucester, we saw the ocean. We really thought we came to heaven. Johnny and I got married in 1970. And in 1974, my husband and my brother and my father bought our first fishing boat. And I became involved with them, but in a very private way with my family. 
but the 70s were hard times. Back then, the Atlantic Ocean was open to the world. There were hundreds of vessels from Germany, France, Spain, Italy. They were from everywhere. Their nets were huge. They were there 24 hours a day, 365 days of the year. Basically, they were vacuum cleaning the ocean. By 1975, 76, everything had disappeared in the ocean. There was no cod, there was no shrimp, there was nothing. We really had this big environmental disaster. One day, I happened to watch the news, the 11 o'clock news. The new 200-mile U.S. fishing limit, which went into effect last midnight, has already resulted in a sharp drop in foreign trawlers. And by midnight tonight, all the foreign vessels will leave the water within 200 miles. The government saw that these boats were just depleting the stocks too rapidly. So they kicked these boats out. Then the next breath they turned around and they started subsidizing the domestic fleet with the same technology that they just kicked out. Now to me that doesn't make any sense at all. It was the craziest thing. New, bigger boats were getting into the fishery every day. With government guarantee loan programs. They gave low-rate business loans. They built big boats, put sophisticated gear on it, and they went out there and started mopping the ocean up, the same as the foreign boats did. There was a gold rush on fish, and everyone bought a boat bankers, lawyers, people who were never into fishing before. What you had is this enormous buildup of the fleet, 50% or more very quickly within four years. We said that we should put a freeze on the industry, but the government told us that we didn't need to because there was plenty of fish in the ocean, and this is the American way of life. Everybody had an opportunity. There were hundreds and hundreds of boats going after smaller and smaller amounts of fish. And by 94, it was like a domino effect. Cod, gone. Haddock, gone. Other species were going right after that. At the end of the 1990s, all the fish populations were at the lowest level they had ever been observed in recorded time. So if we didn't get the fish back, and if we didn't have an agency that had the backbone to do what the law required them to do to get the fish back, really our only resort under those circumstances was to go to court, which is what we did. We were day 25 years ago when all the ocean was getting ripped off by all the factory trolls from around the world. Not so many environmental people, there were none back in those days who cared about the fishing. And now, they know everything. Now they are the saviors. We are the real stewards of the ocean. We've been there for generations. We need to get the state and see what they're thinking. And it's our strong belief that we will give it to the next generation. I can give you a fisherman who understand what's going on. You're welcome, bye. Okay, the TVs are getting interested now. We have to be involved. We cannot leave it all up to the lawyers. I simply don't feel that we can. Because you know what? At the end of all this, they be lawyers, the political people be politicians, the Conservation Law Foundation will be Conservation Law Foundation, the fishermen will be out and to dry. That's it, over. And at least I can say to myself, I tried. This is the way it came out, but we tried. That's all I can say. You had enough? Yeah. Okay. It's time to go home and vent now with John. The community fishermen came together to try to figure out what they were going to be willing to give up and still survive this. If you're not involved in the process, you lose out. 
And so in this whole lawsuit, you know, it was. You had to take a side. There was a reason why we spent through some really difficult meetings, it was decided to intervene on behalf of the environmental groups. But it was a really difficult place for me to be. Why should they expect it? When we came into the lawsuit and we said, hey, you know, the environmentalists are correct, the law has been broken, um, we've been taking too much fish. The problem is the ocean's degraded. The problem is the fish stocks are depleted. Those facts aren't disputable. Each person is interacting in a way that he thinks is sustainable, but the collective impact of everybody is, is not sustainable. I can show you how we will still overfish certain stocks with this plan. So really the only question here is, what are we going to do about it? If we end overfishing, then every year after that gets better. But if we wait 30 years to get sustainable harvests of codfish back to a place like this, all the fishing businesses will be driven out by the high cost of living. No consideration of None. There's a lot of people that say there's a future in the fisheries, and I hope so. I hope this all turns around. But I quite frankly don't have a lot of faith in this process that we're going through now. There's a hope every year that it'll be a good year. It builds up, and there's this humongous amount of hope. OK, this is going to be a good year. This time of year, when, when the fish are running heavy, um, you know, I'll be up at quarter or four in the morning. Go up and have a little breakfast and a coffee and be down here by five. This is probably the start of the heavy part of their fishing season, where they are looking for the mother loads of fish. When you first get a day that all of a sudden all the fish are here and the sound's alive with fish, that's kind of the thrill. One great day like that can make all the difference in the world for the season. Okay. It's a frenzy of bailing the fish into the boat, getting the kill devil set up, and dumping it into the other boat, and everybody's moving, and the water splash, and the birds are screaming. When we have a heavy fish day, it's kind of a rush. You take this one. Everybody just kind of gets a little bit excited about it. They know they're going to have a lot of fish. They know they're going to work hard. They just seem to come to life. What do you need? I go down to the dock, and you know, I'll ask him how, what's going on, and, and he'll say, it looks promising. This looks great. Did you get one? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> no, the last few days have been long days, and we hope that the next week and a half anyway continue like this. Then uh, we'll consider it a good year. He'll hear, he'll hear about we, we had some squid. He'll be back. Our lawyers are down in Washington, and this is the final day of mediation before they come back with a proposal. Hello, Steve? Yeah. Steve? We're just explaining what's in the proposal, then we're going to go to speakerphone, uh, so we're going to be speakerphone to speakerphone down to Washington. What was being proposed was another reduction on the fishing days. Some people would have had as little as 20 days to fish for the whole year. Say zero days reduction, here's what we do with gear. Oh, you're sure not going to go along with that. We have so many restrictions already. As it is, you're only using a boat for six months, seven months a year, and then we've got to put it away. You know, now I don't like going the road of days at sea, but if people have to live with it, can you live with some reduction in days at sea, and under what circumstances? Well, we're never get the fish back. I know, I know. Bluster was willing to negotiate. However, looking at the regulation they're proposing to us, if we agree, we will put some of our own people out of business. If we get 521, 526, it keeps the wires. Yeah. 
I imagine we'll have to compromise a bit there. The leadership in Chatham wanted to go with the cuts that the environmentalists proposed. Whenever the cod fishing is heavy, and I guess you have to give a little to get a little. But where do you draw the line? As you guys are aware, Anne Margaret and I have just returned from an intensive court ordered mediation down in Washington to see if we could find some accord that all or some of the parties could agree to to try to resolve the CLF case. If anybody is not willing to sign on to the confidentiality agreement and agree that what we discuss here does not go outside this room, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. Everybody start signing this, please. Just to get it passed around. In the end, Gloucester fishermen decided to stick together and not sign the agreement that Chatham and other port agreed to. When I thought about why Gloucester didn't sign on, a part of me kind of went, it's good for them, you know? They're, they're saying no. What motivated Chatham to sign was looking at this is the best case scenario that we can come up with, but I don't know how many fishermen were actually aware of what kind of cuts and compromises that were being made in their name. So there's been this dividing of communities. We should have all gotten together along the East Coast and said, we're inshore fishermen. We fish differently. You're going to put us out of business, and only big special interests are going to be still fishing in 10 years. But we didn't. Now that the consensus plan is falling apart, the decision is going to be in the judge's hands. Appreciate everyone being here on such short notice today. Um, Steve and Ann Margaret and the rest of the leadership that's here today are willing and ready to do whatever we come together as a group and say we want to do. I I, um, um, I just want to say um, how uh, proud I am of each of you guys. You had a choice to make, and you chose to stick together. And that was so smart. And it's what's going to carry this port forward as we seek justice, whether we go through the courts, or whether we count on our political leadership to get us there. The position is right. Every port um, from Long Island to Portland is reeling from this decision that took place yesterday. It's not only unfair, it's unjust. And we're going to remedy that. I read the judge's decision yesterday, and uh, quite honestly, I was surprised at the complete lack of understanding of the situation that she evidenced in her decision. It is going to devastate the entire ground fish fishery for all of New England. And what's somewhat sad is that, in part, it stems from the fact that some of our brothers tried to cave in to get some small concessions. And I think they've now learned they're not even going to get those. Right now, I'm not going to sit up here and try to fool anybody and tell you that we're not in our darkest hour. But when I sit up here, and I see a man of the caliber of Mayor Bell get emotional about this industry, then I'm convinced that even though we might be in our darkest hour, it's not going to be a final hour. In this hour, rest assured, as committed as all of us are and remain to be committed, 
is going to end up being the groundwork and the foundation for our finest hour. The timeline on it is tight. It's 10 days. And as far as the court's concerned, the clock has already started ticking. So what Stephen and I need to know is if you guys want to give us the green light to go forward and to take that first step in legal action to go forward with that motion to reconsider. Well, I doubt you go forward. Can we see from uh, a show of hands here today uh, how many are for going forward? And those that are opposed to going forward? Johnny has not been very much involved. He has chosen to stay away. But I can see his anger, I can see his pain. If we had accepted what was proposed to us on Friday, Johnny would only be able to fish like 38, 39 days a year for the whole year. Right now, I really try not to contradict him in any, in any way possible, because I feel it's like a pan, a boiling water that is just, just boiling right now. John, don't worry about it. we're waiting for you. Okay. God is great. God is good. Now we thank Him for our food. Amen. Padre Fidel is great. Santa Cosa. The truth, John, is that. Between now and May 1st, we're gonna find out if we're gonna, you're gonna be able to fish, if you're not gonna be able to fish, if Dominic is gonna be able to fish and everything. And it doesn't, according to the regulation, it doesn't, it, it doesn't look good. Let me finish. We have the boat in the wharf, and it costs us $300 a month. We have the insurance. Mm -hmm. And if you're not gonna be able to fish, I don't know how we're gonna do it. I born be a fisherman, and I don't want. I want to die be a fisherman. Well, then. And you know something? When I die, do me a favor. Get the bag and put it in the water. You save your money. Well, I guess then we better do a lot of praying. I don't want to die a bury me for Medano or Burger King or for some kind of restaurant. I born be a fisherman. I want to die a fisherman. Well, we see what happens. That's all I can I tell care. you. I'm a fisherman. National environmental groups, when they first came onto the scene, wanted to save fish at any cost, and that meant at the cost of fishermen. Unfortunately, Sometimes, when we have severe problems, as we do in New England, that means we're going to have to tell people, you can't fish as much as you would like. Or even, you have to stop fishing completely. On the other hand, other groups, such as the Conservation Law Foundation, were saying, we want to save the fish, but we got to save the fishermen, too. And suddenly, a split was formed in the environmental community. I was really heartbroken because here we had a court order that might be an instrument of real damage, was possibly going to put hundreds of fishermen out of work. And for New England, destroying a heritage that goes back hundreds of years, and we're not willing to do that. get started. Um, first of all, on behalf of the Northeast Seafood Coalition and the membership, we uh, welcome you to our um, Sunday morning event. 
I think this is the turnaround day. This is the day that all the country is going to be watching us. I think we got momentum on our side, and let's just keep it going in a positive, straightforward direction. Today at 9 o'clock, Senator Kennedy will be flying in with an helicopter from INS. We have to give two very important messages. We are the true conservationists, and we are the true stewards of our ocean. We've done this since Gloucester became a fishing town in the early days. Stand proud of who you are, and just keep in mind all the time what you're trying to do. Thank you, and call your family and tell them to come to the boulevard. The eyes of the world are on us right here. We've got ABC News. We've got every news channel in New England. We've got all the print media. There are some signs out there that are not appropriate and aren't going to help the cause. We don't want to talk about violence in the signs, like shooting people. We don't want to talk about profanity. You know what's right and what isn't, but there's a lot of concern about us. We have this opportunity in front of the world. If you have a sign that's on the edge, Please don't fly it. Test one, two, three, four, five. That's better. Thank you. I came up today to support the fishermen of Gloucester. You know, we're all going to take a hit here. Change is coming, and I just wanted to show some sort of support. I don't know if they've done the right thing or not. I don't know if anybody's done the right thing. I think coming out and saying this is a flawed process is the most important message anybody could give at this point. We've lost 5,000 jobs in Massachusetts and 830 vessels. People have made sacrifice. We saw the dream of our children wiped out, that they cannot keep the heritage after seven and eight generations in their family. But we hang on. And now that the stock has been replenished, we get cut down again. This vital industry, the vital industry, the essential industry, the all-important industry, that provides fish to the American families in this country is threatened like it hasn't been threatened for years. And what the families are asking for is not special favors. You're asking for fairness. You're asking to be able to do your work. This harbor out here has seen fishing for 400 years, and we're not going to let it stop now. We're not going to let it stop now. We are going to be your champions, and are you going to stand with us every step of the way? I want to hear it. Thing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Kennedy. Okay, and thank you. Thank you all for coming. Let's wave to the fleet as they hit off the rock. see Ernie's just left the weir and he's on his way in and uh, looks like it's a nice day this is usually a time of year that is crazy the fish are here and weirs are full yesterday was a great day the entire crew was up I went down to the shore today and the boats are coming in and they had some squid and that was it we fish until bluefish come. They're just eating machines that go in to the sound and they just eat up everything. 
and all the other fish scatter out of the sound. They leave. Well, this year they came early and they came today. No matter what he does this year, it's probably not going to be ending up to be a good year. Um, I let Chris so, today is my daughter's prom and we're all trying to be really upbeat and there's this underlining little feeling of dread that's, that's in my stomach that the season's over and it was short. Did she weave these in or just pop them in? She, I think she weaved them in and then she put some in. Alright, you might want to do something here. Hey Dad. Hey Dad. Hey Shannon. <laughs> Here, we'll have to do it over here because we cool. have things plugged in. Does it look cool? Getting ready that. Oh, that's very nice. So it dashes away a few hopes for the year. It it happens, and it's happened before, and everybody's been fine. But um, for it to happen this year, it just makes me a little angry after we could have had a banger year last year, and we weren't allowed to. It's not about the money at all. It's about your self-image um, and your successes. And um, if, if everything just goes with the weirs, I really doubt that I'll be able to stay in this town. Okay, hold on. Okay, see ya. Last year, trap season was a, it was a, a bust. I mean, it was probably the worst, worst year, I think, that uh, we'd seen around here in 40 years. There were days that we would haul a trap and there was virtually nothing in it. Um, I mean, uh, uh, no fish of any kind. You know, it's tough going into another year to entice a crew to come on when they looked at last year and you know, saw that it was a total disaster. I'm not sure how many more hits like this we'll be able to take in our, in our life and go, well, is this really worth it? All you have to do is look at the farm industry to know that we're in the same boat they were 20 years ago. in the mid-90s and has shown almost no sign of recovery since that time. Uh, the stock is seeing a string of about 10 years of poor recruitment. We have high fishing mortality and we have low biomass size and I think that that's a recipe for disaster for that stock and I think that Amendment 13... You know, when you write a story as a journalist, you're supposed to be a bad guy and a good guy. And on a number of other stocks. I had been reading for a long time that the fish were disappearing in the sea. Eight stocks in the common. And I believe the fishermen were taking too many fish. And we've had overfishing continue for a number of years. We need to bring an end to it now. And we have but there's not a fisherman I've ever met that I think is a greedy fisherman. To go along with the right now, fishermen can only go after cod on average 50, 58 days a year, down from 350 only 10 years ago. And still, the regulators think they're going to catch too many fish. My name is Paul Terrio. I'm a commercial fisherman. I am not a lawyer, and I am not an eco-terrorist. I'm not a rat. I'm a human. I don't want to be part of your sick experiment. We've sacrificed for 12 years. For what? For this? And it's no one's fault. It's the fault, if anything, of the federal government that allowed fishermen to build too many boats. They're the ones who gave them all the money to do it. And now they're taking away that right from the fishermen they gave the money to. As many of you know, CLF has been working for nearly 30 years to restore and protect marine resources in New England. First, in partnership with the men and women of Gloucester, Right. to prevent oil and gas drilling on Georgia's bank. While we recognize that New England has made some substantial progress, we believe we still have a long way to go. Let's all get our heels dug out of the ground, accept the responsibility, 
to rebuild the ground fish stocks, roll up our sleeves, and apply that tenacity and ingenuity to design together an innovative plan that works for New England, its fish populations, and its communities. She's not speaking for the public, she's speaking for a pile of money. Please keep the comments and show the courtesy to the speakers. Lion. That's right. Simple lawyers. And the public hearing now, we let the people of the cave finish what they have to say. We're supposed to come here and choose which way we want to die. It's alternative one, alternative two, alternative three, or alternative four. Well, as you heard tonight, people don't want to choose the method of death. 